If you're with us today online, we just want to take a moment to say we see you, hear you, and we're glad you're here. And uh, if you're here on campus, we're delighted you're here as well. Today, we are going to talk about what I think is a very important thing in the Christian life, and that is hearing the voice of God. That's the subject matter today. How do we do it? Why do we do it? So the amazing thing about our God is that he has invited us to this table. That's the amazing thing about our God. We should marvel that we have a seat at the table. We should just marvel at that. But just sitting at the table is not enough because Jesus invited Judas to sit at the table. So just because I have a seat at the table doesn't mean I have security. It doesn't mean that at all. So there's something that I need to know. There's something, there's a way that I need to respond. If I want a seat at the table with Jesus for all eternity, there are some things that I need to understand and know. And so here is what I think Jesus would require of us. He's given us the invitation freely. Come, freely come. But here's what I think that Jesus would require of us if we're going to sit at that table with him. I think that, well, here's my thought. I think we need to learn to know his voice, to understand his heart, and to trust him completely. Let me say that to you one more time. If I'm going to sit at this, sa- this table, I need to know his voice. I need to understand his heart, and I need to trust him completely. Do you? That is so important in the Christian life. And so I want to just stop and take a time out here before I get started today. I'm going to tell you there's a vast difference between people that have a seat in the church versus having a seat at this table. Smile at me when I say that. There are a lot of people that have attached themselves to the church all across America, but don't have a seat at the ultimate table that Jesus offers to you and I. And I believe that is reserved to those, and I'm going to show you this from the Bible today, I believe that it's reserved to those who know his name, who, he, who hear his voice, who respond to him as the shepherd that he is. And so it is so good and so powerful. So with that in mind, Jesus gives us a, an amazing word picture of this whole concept in the Gospel of John chapter 10. If you brought a Bible, you're welcome to turn with me there. I am going to be there all morning. In John chapter 10, there's there's this imagery. It's powerful. It's the image of the role of a shepherd and what role that shepherd plays in the life of the sheep. And, And it's a relationship and it's a play on words between the relationship that Jesus has with you and I. And it's awesome. It's, it's, it's amazing. And this role of the shepherd is a role of protection and grace and mercy. And this shepherd wants us to hear his voice. So it would be It would be remiss on my part if I didn't really drive this home for you today. So so to do that, I have to kind of take you back a couple thousand years. And so if you lived in the Middle East a couple thousand years ago, you would see shepherds all over the place. And one of the things that you would notice on the countrysides and even at the edge of the cities would be what is called a sheepfold. So let me show you a picture of a sheepfold. Um, Sheepfold would look just like that. And it would have walls around it, but there would be an entrance to to go in. And the shepherd, that's where he would sleep at night. The sheep would go in, and that way a wolf can't go over or some type of predator can't go over the wall and attack the sheep. And so this was a way that the shepherd would protect his sheep. And that's how he did it when he was out in the fields. But in addition to that, what's even more powerful than that is that... When a shepherd would have to go into town, he couldn't just leave his sheep out in the wilderness, right? He would have to bring his sheep to the town with him. So what would he do with his sheep? Well, at the, at the, at the entrance of Jerusalem and every major city, there would be these sheepfolds. And they would be a little bit larger than that because they would house more than one shepherd's sheep. So what you would do is you would go into the, into the edge of the city. You would put your sheep into the sheepfold, that shelter there along with maybe five or six other shepherds and their sheep. And so when it was time for you to go, when it was time for you to come and get your sheep, this is what would happen is you would go, because you had spent so much time with these sheep and you knew them intimately, you gave them names, you, they knew your voice. When you, would come to, when you would come to collect your sheep, all you would have to do is stand at the edge of the, of the gate and call out. 
and they would hear your voice and follow you because these sheep would know your voice. They had, they had spent months with you in the wilderness. They had learned to protect you. They had seen you, you know, fend off attackers. So the, the reality is, is these sheep were in a dependent relationship with the shepherd and they would know the voice of the shepherd. All of that brings us to John chapter number 10. That's the setting. That's the context. Until you know that, John chapter 10 isn't going to make any, any sense to you. So in John chapter 10, this is what it said, begin, beginning in verse number one, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold, that's that, that thing you just saw, anyone who, who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he, walk, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will, they will run from him because they, know, because they don't know his voice. So here's what I want you to see. The defining mark of a true sheep, the defining mark of whether you know Jesus or not is do you know his voice? That's what that verse said. The sheep know his voice. And so this, is, this, uh, this really kind of separates the men from the boys, so to speak, in terms of there's a lot of people that have a profession of Christ but not a possession of him. So the only ones that go to heaven are those who possess Christ. He possesses them and, and vice versa. So the reality is this is a pretty important verse of Scripture for me to understand and know and, under, and, and grab a hold of in my life. To have a genuine seat at this table, you must know the voice of the shepherd. Are you with me? Amen. So this is, if I were you, I'd sit up in my seat because what I'm going to explain to you today is how you know that voice. I'm going to explain ex specifically how you learn to recognize the voice of Jesus. There are counterfeits. And every time there's something true, Satan always counterfeits. There are counterfeits who are false shepherds. And the mark of a counterfeit shepherd is always the same thing. A counterfeit shepherd always makes it about them and not the sheep. That's the reality of it. That's the reality. The mark of a counterfeit shepherd is that they are more concerned about themselves, about building a name for themselves. This is the mark of a false teacher than about caring for the people of God. That is so important. It's all about them. Jesus said it this way. I lay down my life for the sheep. Why do I follow Jesus? Because he lays his life down for the sheep. It's so good. Those that come to him find safety and comfort and power and security. The shepherd knows every sheep intimately. He knows if you're one of his sheep, he knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows the dangers you're going to face. He knows everything about you. He knows the sin that you are now contemplating, the sin that you're actively involved in right now as we sit here. He knows everything about you in every way possible. That's the mark of the true shepherd. And he loves us in spite of all of that stuff I just said. He loves us immensely. Jesus is the ultimate security system. We live in an age where security and systems are a pretty big deal, right? I mean, all, you, people either live behind gated communities or, or they live with, you know, cameras in front of their house or ring doorbells or whatever else they have. And, and so we live in an age where security matters, right? Would you, under, would you agree with that? And so uh, with that in mind, I have, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a poor pastor. And so I, I have a kind of a different kind of security system in my house. So let me show you what I do at my house. So, but you should probably just trust in Jesus. But this is what I do in my house. I have a note that I've pre-written. It says, hey, friend, me, Big Jim, and Duke went for more ammunition. Back in an hour. <clears throat> Don't mess with the pit bulls. They attacked the mailman this morning and messed them up real bad. I don't think Killer took part in it, but it was so hard to tell from all of the blood. Anyway, I locked all four of them in the house. Better wait outside, signed Dan. I just lied to you. That's not my security system. But it should be. I mean, I'd save 35 bucks a month. You know what I mean? That probably would work. Or I could just use Jesus as my security in every way. And what I'm looking for is eternal security. I mean, thieves can have my stuff, 
What I want to make sure is that I have a right and a privilege of sitting at that table, that I belong there and the shepherd knows my name. Amen. That's what I want to make sure that I really nail down. There's an ancient hymn that compares those in heaven with believers here on the earth. The author wrote an amazing hymn. I don't know if you remember this hymn. For those that are older in the audience might. It's called Rock of Ages. Anybody remember Rock of Ages, that old hymn? Several of you, the younger people, you should probably Google it this afternoon. It's a great hymn. The guy that wrote that hymn wrote something else. And this is what he says. And I'm going to quote him. And he said this. He said, more happy but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. So let me put that in 20th, first century English. This was written a lot years ago. So let me put that in 21st century English. I, the people in heaven are happier than me, but they are not more secure than me. Now, why would that guy write that? And why would I believe that? I have as much security right now as anybody in heaven, why would I believe that? Because primarily, this is, and this is just amazing to me, the writer said that because he understood a biblical truth, a biblical promise of God. The reason is all bound up in this promise. This is what Jesus said. Listen to it very carefully. I give them, I give who? The sheep. I give them eternal life. This is out of John chapter 10. The same chapter we have been just reading. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. That's, that is security, my friends. That is it. Those that come to him have that kind of security. The sheep, no matter what happens, and I'm not suggesting that if I trust in Jesus, I'm not going to have problems. I'm going to. I'm going to have troubles times. I'm going to have difficulties. I'm going I'm to struggle with sin. I'm going to do all those things. But you know what I don't have to struggle with? Is where I'm going to spend eternity. That's what I don't have to struggle with. Those that know his name have a confidence that God is in control, that God sees my tom yesterdays, my todays, and to my, my tomorrows, and that it's all the same to him, and that he has promised me this kind of security. That's the kind of security that causes me to live in hope and joy and peace inside of my life. Now, having said that, let's go back to hearing the voice of God. My sheep hear my voice. To, ha to sit at this table, to take a seat at this table, I believe you could sit there, but to, have, but to have a rightful privilege there, to really be acknowledged at this table, I need to learn the discipline of hearing the voice of the shepherd. So let's talk about that. How do I learn to do that? How do I learn to hear the voice of the shepherd? Is it possible? Is it possible to hear the voice of Jesus in 21st century America? And I believe that it is. I've experienced it. And I'm going to share with you some things that I've learned along the way. And so I think there are four ways, 21st century America, Reno, fill in your address, your house. I think there are four ways that God speaks to you. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Put your seatbelts on. First of all, the first thing that I would say is the primary way that God speaks is through his scripture, through his written word. So God, listen to me carefully, hang in there with me. This is so important. God has something. God is speaking, and this is so good. God is speaking every day to your life. Every day God is speaking. The question is, are you hearing? That's the only thing at, you know, up for grabs. God is speaking. And the primary way that he speaks is through his scripture. So when I have days where I don't, open that book, that I don't open the scripture and I don't seek after God is a day that I'm forfeiting the voice of God in my life. That is so important for you to hear. It's not, I don't study the Bible because it's a devotion. I don't study the Bible because it's the right thing for Christians to do. I study the Bible because good night, I need the voice of the shepherd in my life to live in this culture. That's what I need. And if, I, and if I forfeit, if I don't open my Bible every day, there are things that I'm going to miss that God wants to say to me out of his scripture. And so I'm just going to say, you know, and I say this lovingly and gently, I know that for many of you, scripture and, you know, reading of the scripture is kind of a hit and miss thing, isn't it? Come, come on. When I feel like it, it happens. And when I'm busy, it doesn't happen. And when I'm, you know, when I have some free time and when I'm not at a football game or when I'm, when, you know, you get it, you get it. We all, we all have busy schedules. But the reality is every time that I don't open the Bible on a daily basis, I'm forfeiting something. I'm losing something. I'm losing the voice of God in my life. So 
That's the first way that God speaks to us, and it is so important to we measure every other way by this way, the Scripture. It's so important. But here's the danger for us. We have been conditioned, and I know many of you read your Bible every day, but we've been conditioned in our culture, this is the danger, to ignore warning and promptings. We have. We've been conditioned by our culture. If you're on social media, if you watch television, you've been conditioned. If you read ads, you've been conditioned to ignore promptings and warnings in your life. So let me see if I can give you uh, some examples of this. So these are products that are on sale and they have warnings on them that we don't read. So uh, the warning on dial soap is this, the directions say this. I'm not lying to you. Use like regular soap. <laughs> Going, okay. I don't use soap. <laughs> no, just, I do. I do use soap. <laughs> this is on the package of pudding. And I'm leaving some of the brand names out because I don't want to influence of what you should buy. But on a package of bread pudding, the product says, we'll be hot after heating. <laughs> I, you know, I would have known that. You know, put it in the microwave. I thought it was going to come out ice cold. I don't, I don't know. And, uh, and this, was the, this is the packaging on an iron, you know, that you iron your clothes with. It says, do not iron clothes on body. <laughs> I know that would be a shortcut, you know, just get your clothes on. Okay, you know, just to put a little iron on the thigh, you know, I mean, that would be, I mean, I'm probably not going to do that without your warning. So, you know, I don't read these warnings anymore. Here, on Nitol, this is Nitol Sleep Aid, warning may cause drowning, drowsiness. Are you kidding me? That's why I'm taking it, because I want to be drowsy. And here's, <laughs> this is one of my favorites, on a bag of peanuts, warning contains nuts. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to do with that. And this is my all-time favorite on a chainsaw. Do not attempt to stop chain with your hands. <laughs> Never even thought of it. I wouldn't have thought about grabbing it by, you know, the blade and, you know, and stopping it. And so, and then, and then there's television that have all these drugs and they say, you know, take this drug for your, you know, ingrown toenail. But here's the, you know, and they, and they mention this drug and they say, oh, by the way, and there's a list of 30 side effects and you have to, you endure these side effects and I'm going fast forward, fast forward. I don't want to hear this. You know, no, 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 no. I'm not going to listen to this. I, you know, and so what I've done is I've trained myself not to listen to promptings and warnings. Because what I'm reading is irrelevant. And so is it possible, maybe, is it possible that I have been conditioned where I'm not paying heed to the warnings and promptings of the Scripture that are there? And there are plenty of them. We live in dangerous, a dangerous age. So we, until we come to the Scriptures, um, you know, the, the bottom line is, and, and approach them seriously, we might be subject to a lot of deception in our life. They give us warnings and tell us about really important, it tells us about really important stuff. So God speaks through his word. He's speaking every day through the word. And when I don't open the Bible, I'm missing the opportunity for God to speak to me personally. And so, and, and by the way, we're going to get to this a little bit later. I'm going to give you a preview of my preview. So I don't read the Bible for information. I read the Bible for relationship. That's how I read the Bible. I read it for relationship. Information is a byproduct of it, but I read it for, for what it is. It's, it's my means of relationship to the living God, and God speaks to me and then gives me an opportunity to speak back to him. So then, not only does God speak through the Holy Scripture, but God speaks through, uh, God speaks through his Holy Spirit uh, through promptings in our heart. He speaks by the Holy Spirit through promptings in our heart. So let's talk about that. And before I go on, I'm just going to say the way that I measure whether it's of God or not is that I always compare it. Does this, does this contradict what the scripture says? So you're sitting here today and you're saying, okay, I'm going to start listening to God's promptings. And I'm prompted to walk up on stage and slap Pastor Dan in the face. <laughs> well, if we measured that by the Bible, we would probably come to the conclusion that's probably not a good thing for you to do, right? I mean, would you agree? I ho would you agree with that? Come on now. <laughs> I'm hoping you're all saying, yeah, that, that's me. That'd be a bad thing to do. All right. So I always measure these promptings of the Holy Spirit by the word of God. And it takes discipline to hear the Holy Spirit speak. So let me explain to you what I mean. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and all of a sudden realize that there are noises all around you that you were unaware of? 
that you're talking to somebody. Now this, I'm going to tell you some really good stuff here. So really sit up and listen to this. This is good. It happens to me all the time. Like traffic. You'll be sitting in a Starbucks outside and you'll be talking to somebody and you, you know, and st- until something startles you, you will tune out the traffic around you. That's what happens all the time. Or right now, I'm hoping you're listening to me, but let's just quiet it for a second. You hear that fan? It's blowing right now. But until I called your attention to it, you probably just tuned it out, right? We have things happen like, to us like, like that all the time. There's noises all around us, crickets and, and uh, background noise, music in a restaurant. We all learn to tune that kind of stuff out. Or has this ever happened to you? You're watching TV and all of a sudden, well, I'll just put it in personal perspective because this happened to me. You're watching TV and you realize and recognize that, well, I'll recognize that my wife is standing right next to me talking to me, <laughs> like for the last five minutes. And I just haven't, I haven't heard a word. She's, are you, are you talking to me? Did you say something to me? And, you know, I mean, is that, has anybody, has that ever happened to anybody else besides me? Okay, so we have learned to just tune things out. So here's what I want you to understand. If I'm going to hear the voice of God's promptings in my life, if I really want to hear the Holy Spirit speak to me, then I have to turn up the volume of the background sounds. So let me say it to you this way. Listening to God is the ability to drown out that which is in front of us in order to hear that still small voice in us. Let me say it to you one more time. You, don't, you, might, want to take, you, want, you might want to write this down. This is really good stuff. Listening to God is the ability to drown out that which is in front of us in order to heal that, hear that still small voice that is in us. God speaks in a still small voice. He's been speaking to you I'm guessing this whole entire time you've been sitting here. He's been, he's been speaking. But there's so much foreground interaction that you can't hear that still small voice. So it takes a lifetime to learn how to do this. This is not something you say, I tried it once, it doesn't work. You've got to learn the discipline of hearing that still small voice inside of you and recognize when it's coming from God. And that's a process of learning by trial and by error. And it's a lifetime of learning how to hear that voice. And if you don't ever start the journey, you're going to end up dying, never really hearing the voice of God in your life. And that would be sad. That would be miserable. Every major decision that I make, every major decision that I make, I don't make it until I've heard the voice of God. I mean, I just don't. I just, I'm not, I'm, I'm too stupid to make decisions on my own. I want to know that God is in this. I want to know that God is leading in this. I want to know the voice of God. I want to know what God thinks about this decision. And so I'm just simply saying to you, learning this discipline is so darn important. And yet it's something that it's rarely talked about in church. And it is the most, one of the most under-talked things about this still small voice, this Holy Spirit speak inside of you that is actively speaking to you all the time. And every once in a while, we intersect it. Sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. So important. Then there's another way that God speaks to us, and that is through godly counsel. Oftentimes, friends, family members, pastors, leaders will will take me aside and say, hey, have you, ever, have you thought about this? You might be making a mistake here. So if I'm not listening to godly counsel, I might be missing out on hearing the voice of God in my life. Everybody needs to have godly people around them so that they can bounce things off of, so that they can, so that they can run their thoughts that are going through their head to somebody else and, and confirm that, yeah, you're crazy. Yeah, it's true, you're crazy. Or, yeah, that's right. That's, that's the right thing. Everybody needs that because God shows up in counsel. God shows up in godly counsel. And it's so, so practical, but it's so good. And again, it's so intertaught. And then there's, there's another thing. There's another way that God speaks. And that is that God speaks through authority. So I'm going to go into some controversial stuff here so, for just a minute. But it's all biblical. So God speaks through authority. So when you, so when when you rebel against authority that God has placed over your life, 
You step outside, I believe, of hearing God's voice for your life. You're on your own sometimes when you step outside of that authority. Let me show you this in the Bible. Can I do that? Amen. So in Acts chapter 13, God is getting ready to call Barnabas and Saul, that is the Apostle Paul. You remember him, right? He wrote a good portion of the New Testament. He's getting ready to call Barnabas and Saul for the work of the ministry. And so the leaders of the church have been praying and fasting in Jerusalem. And this is what it says, Acts 13. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Do you see that word there? The Holy Spirit said, appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work for which I have called them. God used the leadership of that church in Jerusalem as a calling on Paul's life. Aren't you glad he listened? Because we now have a good portion of the New Testament because he listened to the authority over his life. And I'm just going to be honest. We live in an age where uh, in this generation and this time in this country, we don't trust authority, do we? Does anybody besides me in the room see that we might be forfeiting something by that mistrust of authority? I think we should question. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't question. I think we should use our brains. I think we should seek God's counsel. I think we should do all of those things. But listen carefully. God, one of the means that God uses to speak to us is through authority. So be very careful. That's one of those warnings, right? that we kind of drowned out. Be very careful to drown out the voice of authority in your life because you might be forfeiting the voice of God for you. Does that make sense to you? Amen. I have a good brother in the front here that's <laughs> agreeing with everything I say. Amen, brother. Thank you. I appreciate that. He and I are trying to convince you of something here. All right? Okay. All right. So the Bible is so important and very clear that authority is a very important thing in God's mind and God's heart. So I know that the, you know, a lot of the generations younger than me have, they, 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 were, they were raised questioning authority. And some of it is rightfully so. But all I say is be very careful not to reject God-ordained authority in your life. Because if you do, you'll suffer the consequence from rejecting that authority and I know that's maybe not what you want to hear but it's what you need to hear it's what the Bible says God appoints authority over our lives so how do you then you do you prepare to listen okay all right I'm in Pastor Dan I'm in I want to hear the voice of God I really do I want to hear the voice of God in my life so where do, I, where do I start? How do I, where do I even begin to hear the voice of God? So let me suggest it starts with a strong desire you wake up every morning and say, God, I don't want to go through this day without hearing your voice. It starts with a strong desire inside of your life. It starts with you saying, making a decision in your soul today to say, I want, I need, I desire. I don't want to live mine. I'm going to grab a hold of you, God, and I'm not going to let go until you speak. I, that's the strong desire that is, must be there if you want to hear the voice of God in your life. You know, the work of the devil, listen to me carefully. Listen to an old guy for a minute. The work of the devil is always passivity. It is. If he gets, if he gets you becoming passive, he wins. He wins. Passivity is, his, is his, one of his major tools. It's one of his favorite tools. He doesn't have to work very hard in our culture to get you to be passive. You know, he just has to put his foot out a little bit and you trip over his toe. And then, you know, you say, ouch, that hurt. And I'll never do that again. You become passive. I'm just saying, you've got to resist passivity and you've got to start this desire. You've got to start when listening to the voice of God. You've got to start with a strong desire in your life. I can't live without it. That's the kind of desire you have to have. And then you have to have also a predetermined obedience that whatever you know for sure that God is saying, Whatever you know for sure that God is saying to your life that you're not going to question, you're just going to do it. And you've measured it by the Bible. You know that, that it agrees with the Bible. So you would have to have this predetermined obedience. You're going to say, so here's how we normally obey God. We say, God, you show me, you tell me, and then I'll decide. That's backwards. 
What we should be saying is, God, I'm going to obey you because I trust that you have my best interest. I'm going to have a predetermined obedience in my life. And then read Scripture relationally, just, not just informationally. I get up and read my Bible because I want to have relationship with God, which automatically sets my framework and sets my mind in the, in the relationship of really doing, a, you know, really being intentional with the voice of God in my life. And then I need to work on listening, not just learning. I can be a student of God's Word all of my life and never hear the voice of God. I've got to work on listening as opposed to just learning. So, you good with all that? You're going to start practicing it? I want to end with one last story. You know the band Mercy Me? Christian band, popular band. First popular song as I can only imagine. And uh, it was, you know, made a movie about that particular band and that song. And uh, it was a beautiful thing. And uh, so this is what happened. Is that after he wrote that song, and he wasn't actually going to record that song, it just happened that the person that was going to record it turned it over to him and said, you record it. So he records that song and he goes, it goes, you know, just viral all around the world. So the recording label automatically puts him on, you know, on travel, concerts, traveling all around the world, singing his song, has a few other songs that he sing. But also this recording label wanted him to write some other songs and gave him a deadline. And he knew that he was, you know, he, had, he didn't have any white space in his life. Every night he was singing another concert, doing someplace, getting on a plane, traveling somewhere, singing. And uh, it was the night before his deadline. And he had to come up with a song to record. Or his recording label was going to probably drop him. That's how they work. So he goes to bed frustrated. And while he's sleeping, the Holy Spirit gives him a song. He wakes up the next morning, writes it out verbatim. That's a God thing. Writes it out verbatim. And it became a very popular song. And uh, I'm, glad that the Holy, I'm glad he listened to the Holy Spirit. It is called Word of God Speak. So listen to these words. Word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know You're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. God is speaking. God is speaking every day. He's speaking more than you can imagine. The problem is, is you've got to tune in to His channel and listen every day for His voice and learn to identify that voice so that you, because His sheep know His voice and they follow Him because they know His voice. I hope and pray that that describes you. I do. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for this great truth. And I pray, God, that your spirit will drive this deep within our, our soul. Lord God, I pray for everyone here that we would desire with intense desire to hear your voice. In Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name, I pray, amen.